Joy. <laughs> Latanya. Darren. What a joyous occasion this is to have this black girl magic, <laughs> this brilliance enveloped in this room. Dr. LaTanya Sweeney wouldn't tell you this about herself because she's a woman of great modesty. The first African-American woman to receive a PhD in computer science at MIT. Joy Bulamwini would not tell you that the PhD in computer science that she will shortly receive is an additional credential stacked on top of that Rhodes Scholarship. <laughs> and the room full of credentials that reflect the ways in which excellence is personified in our community. Both of you are pioneers in a space where women like you are often invisible, are not present in the room, and yet you have demanded that the doors be open. And you are giving insight and shedding light on the pernicious effects of something most of us, us believe to be simply unbiased. I mean, how could AI, the promise of AI is that at last we can have objective measurements, evaluation systems that move us from the injustice in the analog world to justice in the digital world. So can we have justice in this new digital world? LaTanya, when you came to the Ford Foundation and blew the roof off of the building with the presentation you did demonstrating how the effects of racism manifest in simple exercises of aggregating names. Could you tell us a little bit about how we see that manifest on the internet? Sure, actually that story started with when I had first arrived here at Harvard and I was being interviewed by a reporter and the reporter wanted to see an article I had written so I go and I type my name into Google and up popped um, the, the link to the paper but also some ads that implied I had an arrest record. And the reporter said, forget the, ad, forget the article, tell me about the time you were arrested. And I said, well, I wasn't arrested. And he says, then why did your computer say you were? Um, and so we go back and forth for a little bit and I click on the link into paying the fee, all just to show that the company, one, had no arrest record for anyone named Latanya Sweeney. But that started, uh, started me taking two months, typing in the names of real people, trying to understand how this came to be. And I did hundreds of thousands of searches across the United States and learned that the company had actually put down ads on the names of all real, uh, uh, real Americans, or real adults rather, who they believe lived in the United States. But if your name was given more often to a black baby than a white baby, an ad would pop up implying you had an arrest record. But if your name was given more often to white babies, it didn't. And the, and the difference was huge. It was like 80 to 20% like difference. And discrimination in the United States isn't illegal, we, but we do have protected groups in, the, in certain situations, and one of those groups are blacks, and one of those situations is employment. And the argument that I made was that when you apply for a job, you, someone will look online to see what information is about you. And this put uh, African American and black applicants at a tremendous disadvantage because right away the computer was sort of implying 
something about them that often wasn't true. That it turned out to be exactly what was needed to open other uh, in the Department of Justice a civil rights investigation. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time any of us, I was a, I'm a computer scientist by training, and it was the first time any of us thought in terms of, oh my gosh, this computer is racist. <laughs> and why, how did this come to be? And so that was sort of the start of, uh, uh, of a real awakening uh, that now we see it engaged in so many ways that the pursuit of technology is not exempt from the same ills that we find in other parts of our society and maybe even be more potent today. But before you, this had not happened. So why didn't some white guy computer scientist <laughs> figure this out? Well, first of all, if he was searching for his name, he would have gotten a nice neutral ad. Uh, so he may not have been uh, sparked by it. So this speaks directly to the idea of me being who I am in, this, in that situation and having one of those black sounding first names. And so what can we extrapolate from this? Because I know that some of the work that you have continued to do has looked at the predictive analytics that are being used around which major decisions are being made that impact people's lives far beyond employment. Yeah. So I was also the, uh, I took time off from Harvard to be the chief technology officer at the Federal Trade Commission. And one of the things that became very clear is um, how technology was allowing the, the very specific types of fraud, very specific ways to disenfranchise people to really exist. And that was everything from if you're on the internet, what, and um, so for most households in the United States, everyone's most frequently visited websites are the same first 10. But after number 10, they deviate greatly, all, all, uh, specifically based on whether or not you have a child, your income, your education level, your race, and your interest. And the more you get into a community that you feel is more like you, the more you trust. And those are the places where huge frauds happen. And so that was kind of this interesting relationship we began to learn over and over again at the FTC around the, about where, where, how people trust their social networks and so forth in the internet and how they can be manipulated against them. And we were able, to, that became part of when I came back to Harvard, our investigations with students, I teach a class here called uh, Tech Science to Save the World. And we began looking through 2016, how would old ways in which people were disenfranchised from voting show up in technology? And the work showed many discoveries, but one of them was we were the first to show those 36 voter registration websites and their vulnerabilities. And this year we taught the class and we were able to um, point out uh, a vulnerability in the 2020 census that will go online. These things matter because they're subtle in the sense that if somebody disenfranchises you to vote online, you still show up at the polling place, except you're not in the poll book. So they give you a provisional ballot so you think you voted, but in many states, the vote doesn't count. Or in the census, a miscount can lead, determines the number of representation, amount of representatives we have in the House of Representatives, and therefore can tilt the balance of Republicans and Democrats. So these things are, in some ways, tend to be small, but the manifestations of them are huge. So Joy, you have started an organization called the Algorithmic Justice League, a new civil rights organization for the 21st century. And you have also brought Amazon, IBM to their knees. I mean, <laughs> it is you who shame them on the front pages of the New York Times and in media to, by calling them out, by calling them out on the ways in which they were making millions of dollars selling facial recognition programs and other products that were actually flawed. And your research demonstrated that they were flawed, but they didn't want to hear that from you, it sounds like. <laughs> well, with the Algorithmic Justice League, 
I started it because I was working on an art project that went awry. And so I'm sure everybody in this audience has heard of the white gaze, the male gaze. Well, to that, I add the coded gaze. And the coded gaze is a reflection of the priorities, preferences, and also prejudices of those who have the power to shape technology. So I was working on an art project that used face detection, so when I looked at a mirror, I would say, hello, beautiful, or I'd put a lion on my face so I could become Serena Williams, just for fun. I'm at the Media Lab, we do these kinds of explorations. Yeah. So as I was working on this project in a class called Science Fabrication, which is about visioning what might be and trying to see if you can manifest it now, I noticed there was a problem. The face detection software I was using, it worked fine for my friend's face. But when it came to my face, uh, I ran into a little problem. <laughs> but I got an assist, right? So literally coding in a white mass, I mean, Fanon already said it, but I didn't think it would be so <laughs> literal when it happened. <laughs> And so I had the opportunity to share this on the TED platform. And in that talk, this is when I talked about launching the algorithmic justice league, because I'm thinking, well, if they can't get our faces right, what else <laughs> could be going uh, wrong? And I also noticed I had something in common with the women of Wakanda. And so when the Black, when the Black Panther came out, I decided to run their faces. They were either not detected, some of them were misgendered. But then I decided to test out age classification, age estimation. So those red columns you're seeing are under the age header. It's verified black don't crack. We see it <laughs> here. <laughs> but it, it really became more serious in terms of thinking towards justice when I read a report from Georgetown Law showing one in two adults, over 130 million people, has their face in a face recognition network that can be searched by law enforcement unwarranted using technology that hasn't been audited for accuracy. This is why one of the reasons why we audited Amazon, because they're selling to law enforcement right now. They're trialing this technology with the FBI. Now, some people are also saying, look, not being detected, that's not the worst thing, right? <laughs> Maybe we got a windfall. But for me, it wasn't not being detected detected, but what happens when you're misidentified? So in the UK, where they've actually done performance metrics, they showed that they had false positive match rates of over 90%, more than 2,400 innocent people being falsely matched, and even cases of women being matched with uh, men. Last week, a teenager, an African-American uh, teenager, is suing Apple for $1 billion because he's been misidentified through some of the uh, facial analysis recognition uh, technology that's out there. So because this technology is actually in the real world and can change people's lives in a material way, that's why I started the Algorithmic Justice League and that's why I've been challenging large tech companies. And recent research, which we were emailing about uh, a couple of weeks ago, truly bowled me over. So talk about the results of the research around uh, autonomous vehicles and Ooh. people of color. So <laughs> <laughs> you probably know where this goes. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, back up really quickly. So my MIT research was called Gender Shades. And what I did, along with Dr. Timnit Gebru, and you see us posing for uh, Bloomberg 50 right there, uh, looking fierce with our uh, co-founder of Black and AI, uh, what we were showing was that if you looked at skin type as a way of evaluating facial analysis technology, you would find different kinds of disparities than if you just looked at race. So other researchers took that idea and said, okay, let's apply it to self-driving cars and let's look at pedestrian tracking technology. So using the similar kind of methodology that was developed in Gender Shades, they tested it on the cars. Turns out they're less accurate for darker skinned individuals when it comes to tracking. So the promises of self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, literally not being seen has real world consequences. So like, wait, so, <laughs> so let's just be really clear. So in this new digital world, if you are black, you are, most li you are more likely to be run over by an <laughs> autonomous vehicle? We gotta be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Extra careful. <laughs> so that's why I go in white face sometimes, just so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we 
<laughs> but that's the irony, is that in this new digital world, we may literally have to wear white face. Yeah. That is the new irony, sadly. Well, I would like to say, I do think computer science can do better. <laughs> Says the PhD from MIT. So uh, tell us how we make that happen, Dr. Sweeney. <laughs> So look, technology design is really the new, the, sort of the new policy maker. And these decisions are being, it's really a reflection of people building technology in their own image. AI has always been this idea of building machines in your likeness. And when, when that, as they're building AI, what is like them is being overfitted to the fact that they're often white men in their 20s. And this is something I call the problem of pale male data sets. So when pale I'm, male data sets. Pale male and sometimes stale, but often male data sets. OK, so when I was doing the research for gender shades, I started looking at all of these data sets of faces. And I looked at data sets that were used as gold standards. And what came up time and time again was the overrepresentation of lighter skinned individuals, the overrepresentation of men, and the underrepresentation of women, and especially women of color. So if you're thinking about AI and machine learning as one of the ascendant approaches, machines are learning from what? Data. So in this case, data is destiny. And if we have pale male data sets, we're destined to fail the rest of society, whether it's on our streets because we can't detect uh, different kinds of individuals, whether it's in a healthcare setting where people are trying to detect things like melanoma or see if you can infer things like early signs of dementia. So the lack of representation, I call this uh, power shadows that end up in our data sets and our evaluation uh, benchmarks as well. So. LaTanya, you were the CTO at the FTC. What does government need to do about this? Is there a role for government in this? I mean, in the, in the old analog world, we had a Civil Rights Act. We had the EEOC. Yeah. We had a regulatory regime that protected the public interest. Yeah. We have yet to define what the public interest is in this new digital world. Well, in a lot of the work that we do, we, I, use, I take the fact that people fought very hard uh, for, and we saw a lot of that in the scenes that were shown earlier, for the rights and the regulations that we have now. As technology rolls out, it just sort of, it dictates how we're going to live our lives by what technology allows us to do or doesn't allow us to do. And what people don't seem to realize is that every democratic value is up for grabs by what technology allows or doesn't allow. And so it's been incredibly important to be able to produce technologists sort of in the public interest, a group of technologists who are interested in understanding how to find these unforeseen consequences to shore up journalism, to shore up our regulators, and to help us really apply the laws and regulations we have to technology. And also to help technologists uh, do their job better. I, for many people in high tech, I don't think this was ever intended. For many of them, it really is an unintended consequence. So there's also a call or a need for technologists to do their job better in the high tech companies as well. But we, we know that, for example, one of the reasons I've come to know you is because at the Ford Foundation, we have been working on this new field of public interest technology. Yeah. Because just as there needed to be a field created of public interest law in the 1960s, we need to think about what the public interest is in this new digital world. And in fact, it's the private sector who has determined the bounds of what is public and private. And we saw in the Zuckerberg hearings mm. where we witnessed the, I think, the interaction of capitalism and democracy, and democracy lost. Yeah. Because there was no one sitting behind those Congress people, yep. passing them notes giving them questions to interrogate 
the tech executives because most of the capacity in this space is in the private sector. Yeah. And so one of the things we have to think about is how do we train a generation of public interest technologists like yourselves mm -hmm. who are gonna fight the fight for justice yeah. in this new digital world. So Joy, from your standpoint, What's needed most at this time to protect the public interest? It's a big question and it's not just one thing. I still believe that as we're talking about public interest technologists and as we're thinking about how computer scientists, how policy makers can shape the future, we have to also remind ourselves the importance of the artist and the storytellers. So the work that I've done thus far, I really believe that part of the reason it's gained attention is because of that visual of coding in a white mask. There were FBI experts who did a facial analysis tests before, but they didn't take the approach of calling out. I also think that how we're trained as computer scientists has to change so that there's a sense of responsibility. We had a, a doctor up here earlier who was very courageous and standing up for Flint saying, we take an oath. We don't do that as computer scientists. We think we can uh, create the world, we can break things, and until it's actually confronted, we don't actually have to make any changes. And so I think changing how we learn to be computer scientists will be a huge part of it, but not thinking that computer scientists or technologists can solve it alone. So you see the role of the arts and humanities. I mean, so do you see a new curricular being needed, President Bacow, here <laughs> and in other places. Absolutely, and I'd like to talk about how, let's say, looking at the social sciences influenced my own work. So with Gender Shades, we went through, we made a new data set, et cetera, and so forth. And what we were able to show is that the current way we're taught, thinking about the curriculum, is to look at data and information in aggregate. And so if you see the aggregate performance for some of these companies, it seemed okay. So then we said, let's break it down and let's look at what the implications are for gender and we see gaps. Let's look at what the implications are for skin type and we see gaps. But what I was able to do was then bring in Kimberly Crenshaw and say there's something we can learn as computer scientists from what she did with anti-discrimination law, saying that single axis analysis is not enough. And so what happens when you marry that with computer vision? Well, this is what we got. We provided a new kind of perspective of looking at the data. And here we see that for one group, the pale males, you have 100% performance. And then for another group, women of color, right, you have the worst performance. And when we disaggregate that, we got to error rates as high as 47%. So as a computer scientist sitting in my body, as somebody who's also reading Crenshaw, I'm able to then provide new insights into what we're doing with computer vision and computer science. But Dr. Sweeney, Dr. Sweeney, are you encouraged by what you are seeing in the classroom here at Harvard? Oh my gosh. So the Save the World class, you know, students want to do good and they want the work that they do to really matter and change the world. And uh, the class has really touched the lives of a lot of the students. They've gone out, they've done amazing things. They've gotten Facebook to fix bugs. They've gotten Airbnb to address price discrimination. They were the first to point out uh, problems in the Affordable Care Act. I mean, the list of accomplishments that these students have done goes on and on and on. And we do have to th uh, thank the Ford Foundation too because the Ford Foundation has given us the funds to allow the students to explore these unforeseen consequences wherever they may be. And the students have just really, they literally mean save the world. Um, and it's been phenomenal. It's made a big difference. I just wanna say uh, also that the space of problems are huge. 
So there, from algorithms being used, not just in our homes, but also determining what you're gonna see on your social media feed, to also uh, determining sentencing and recommendations for, around recidivism, all of which show unfairness and bias in them. And so the, the, the amount of work is huge, so some of it is a matter of shoring up and giving knowledge to those who have the power to help us make the change. And Joy, final word. What do you have to say to this audience of people who are assembled here because we care about justice in America and in the world, and we don't all understand this new technology. In fact, it's a little frightening mm. to some of us. Should we be frightened? We should be working together so there's less to fear. And I hope that all of you will join me in moving towards algorithmic justice because we've entered the age of automation overconfident and underprepared. You see in this chart behind me all of the areas in which automated decision making is starting to enter our lives. So it's up to us, we who are here and also in the live stream, to be asking questions. If you're going for a job interview and they're using AI to make a determination, ask what's going on. Also share your stories. We have bias in the wild reports that are submitted to the Algorithmic Justice League where people are like, my Snapchat, not work, whatever it might be. <laughs> You know, so I think it's really important that people feel they have a voice and you don't feel like, oh, if I'm not a technologist, if I don't have PhDs from MIT, I can't be part of this conversation. But that's not true. We need to move towards participatory AI where those who are at the margins are actually centered when it comes to decision making around the technology that's shaping our lives and shaping society. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Latanya Sweeney and Joy Bulamwene. And Darren. And Darren. <laughs>